Hello, and welcome to the Fish Nerds. It's a celebration of fish, fishing, and hopefully the history of fishing. That's always interesting and usually funny and mostly true. I'm Liz Kovart from Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history, and here are your nerds. And I'm Clay Groves, your friendly neighborhood fish nerds. Just me today, but the good news is I've had some help from get, help with getting this show together. And before we begin, we've got a few new reviews uh, on the old iTunes. Uh, so if you have not already been to iTunes, leave us a review. One of the ways people find our show is through iTunes. Because leaving a review makes it easier to decide they want to listen to us. And we need more listeners so we could uh, become the fish nerds media empire we need to be. So here are some reviews. Uh, Nerds is the title. This is by RSC Imagery. I have no idea what that means, but they give us a five-star rating, which is the only right rating you want to give us. And they simply said, I love fish in the news, which is good because I also love fish in the news. And there's another one by Zenger. Do you like fishing in podcasts? Five-star rating. This podcast covers a lot of aspects of fishing, fishing culture, and eating fish. I enjoy it. And love to listen when fishing. So thank you, Zenger. And here's another another one. Great show. It's about fishing and more. That's true. It is about fishing and more. This is from Harold R. He. Five-star rating. Excellent conversations with awesome energy and style. Learn some tips and tricks about fishing. While it's not only about fishing, you better enjoy fish talk. Well, it's called The Fish Nerd, so you also better enjoy fish talks. Um, and... And I'm, I'm actually going ice fishing after recording this show. I was going to do an ice fishing report, but I can't do it because I'm recording before going ice fishing. So we're going to go out. My friend Vinny and I are going to go out and check out one of the small ponds that probably has skim ice on it right now. I'm probably going to, we're going to die. Um, <laughs> probably got to. You can hear laughing in the background. I have Nate Hill here from Hill Country Guides. And that's, uh, what's the website again? It's www.whitemountainflyfishing.com. Yep. So in my intro, when I said I was, fish, I was alone on the show, I was lying. I actually have Nate next to me So yeah. <laughs> while I'm doing all this stuff. But he's going to be with us talking a little bit um, in just a few minutes. This show is supported by the Fish Nerds Guide Service, the only ice fishing service serving the Mount Washington Valley. If you want to fish with me, Clay Groves, head to fishnerds.com to book your trip. We specialize in family-friendly ice fishing adventures. And coming this February, we're offering a new romance-slash-bromance night fishing package. So get out with your friendly night person, whoever it may be, with us and fish for the most romantic of all New Hampshire fish. Do you know what the most romantic fish is? I don't. What is it? It's the burbot. Oh. Have you ever caught a burbot? I haven't, but I've seen... They, they're like giant cod eels. They are. They're cool. E- eel pouts, some people call yep. them. You should come out and have a little bromance with me one night. Sounds like a plan. Yeah, it'll be really great. We can hold hands and snuggle. <laughs> we'll be so warm with our beards. <laughs> but anyway, that's coming in February, just before they spawn. Uh, and if that's not sexy, I don't know what is. So go to fishnerds.com for more information and special deals and rates for our first year in business. So what do you think about that? Bromance packages. Sounds like a great idea. Yeah. I got that. I stole that idea from Wilson's on, Wilson's on Moosehead, Moosehead Lake, Maine. There you go. Yeah, I was talking to the guides up there, and they said, you should do a bromance package. And I went, okay. Yeah. Because I need ideas. All right. So <clears throat> as uh, listeners should know, is we have a Facebook group called the Fish Nerds Podcast. Uh, we have a Fish Nerds Facebook page with like 14,000 people on it, but Facebook suppresses pages. They don't like businesses um, to do business without paying them. So we've created a, a private group called the Fish Nerds Podcast where our hardcore fans hang out and talk fish. You're on there. Yeah. I've invited you. I'm not sure if you ever check in, but you're on there. Am I? Okay. Yeah. I'll have to check in more. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll tag you in some posts. There you go. Um, but um, we have a lot of anglers on there, a lot of listeners there. And our friend Dana Snyder and her husband Jeffrey have been sharing great photos and videos of the fish they have been catching in the Niagara River. And this sparked a conversation about fish and, of course, their techniques. Um, I should also say cause, uh, that, that I needed to speak to a female angler this week. Uh, because we got called out on another podcast for being a show that's just for men. Uh-oh. And I don't know if any people who follow the Fish Nerds know that we don't, like a lot of a lot of Facebook groups and a lot of websites have like the bikini ice fishing team and all these kind of like right. 
overtly sexist things. We don't participate in any of that at the Fish Nerds. We we like we find women attractive and all you know <laughs> all kinds of people attractive, but we don't want to. We have I have daughters. I I want to make sure that they see this as a sport for everybody, and so we don't we don't play that game yeah. very well. Um, but anyway, another podcast called She Podcast uh, was talking about our show, and they were being nice about our show because oh, that's good. Yeah. Uh, but they said that it's a show for guys because f- women don't fish. What? And can you believe that? That's not true. Now, as a guy, do you take ladies fishing? Honestly, I've seen more women every year since I started guiding. Yeah. And I, I, I always tell guys, you know, just know if you bring your, you know, your wife, your friend who's a female, your daughter, they're probably going to catch more fish than you. Yep. Yeah. Yep. In nine times out of ten. Uh, that's Maybe all, ten times out of ten. My, my wife and my daughters outfish me most times. I think it's a it's a different touch on the rod, more sensitive, yeah. something else well, going on. They're good at listening. They pay attention. They pay attention. Yeah. And they want to defeat you because they've got to prove it to us because we do live in a world that is kind of sexist still. Yeah. And so they like I, to I actually think they don't really us. care. They're just that good. That oh. They're just like, <laughs> oh, I, I just caught another one. Yeah. Oh, my but, favorite is, am I doing it right? I got a four-foot fish. Right, did I win? Am I is this good? a good one? Yeah. Right, yeah, you win. <laughs> Shut up. Yeah. But anyway, so that's She Podcast. Um, I recommend you go to find She Podcast on Facebook, and you start posting pictures of fish that women have caught uh, to prove to them. Uh, yeah. Elsie Escobar and Jessica Kupferman uh, do a really fun show, and they talk about us a few times and we want to keep them talking about us and their show is called sheep podcast it is a podcast for women, women but i listen to it anyway because um same reason i read, Co- read cosmo is i want right. to understand the world around me by the way it doesn't help me understand anything but it it's no fun. it just kind of confuses it, everything more yeah yeah. Well, so, yeah let's go fishing so but before i play you the interview i did with um with dana snyder we're going to nate since nate's here we're going to talk about center pin fishing because that's the type of fishing they're doing in the Niagara River. Um, so, Nate, what do you know about center pin fishing? And by the way, I never in my life, all the fish reading I do, have never heard oh. the phrase center pin fishing until I talked to Dana Snyder on the phone. Right. Well, center pin fishing is a, I, I kind of consider it like a hybridization between fly fishing and spin fishing. Now, in um, New Hampshire, is it considered fly fishing? I don't think so. Really? No. Yeah. Um, you can fish flies under a center pin rig. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it has nothing to do with the, the type of fly you're. Well, you can use bait or flies under a center pin rig. Let me just say that. Now, let's back up. What is yeah. center pin fishing? Center pin fishing is using um, a, a a certain type of reel on a long rod, and the reel the reel is a free spooling large arbor or large reel it looks like a fly reel the difference is you put single diameter monofilament on it versus a fly line so that you can lob a bobber rig upstream let it float downstream and then <clears throat> the the line goes out at the same speed as it goes out of the reel at the same speed as the current so you can get extremely long dead dr- what's called a dead drift where, where the bobber is floating the same speed as the current we do the same thing with a fly rod where you you use the fly line to cast a strike indicator, also known as a bobber. But you're too fancy. Yeah, those fly fishermen <laughs> call it a strike indicator. It's yeah, a bobber yeah. um, with a fly underneath. And the difference between center pinning and fly fishing is with the fly line, with that heavy fly line, I need to do what's called m- mend the line, where I lift the line above the bobber. And I have to do that continuously as it goes down the river to keep that fly, the, those flies from dragging. Whereas with the center pin rig, they can just li- let the line slide out of the reel. And and if I'm getting this wrong, I, I might be getting something technically slightly hey, wrong. Being wrong is okay. But I'm pretty sure yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's the difference. Um you can let the you can get a much longer drift. So basically it's the same technique. You can just cover a little bit more real estate. Um when you talk to like the real hardcore fly f- fly fishermen, they're like, Oh, that's not real that's not real fly fishing. But then again there's there's even more um I guess maybe elitist fly fishermen who won't even fish a strike indicator. They just want to swing flies and it's not real fly fishing if you're fishing nymph. So in fly fishing, there's all these different, I guess, cultures. Yeah. You know? I, I've in seen fishing, it, yeah. there's all these different cultures. I, it really is. You know, it's yeah. kind of like the difference between uh, snowboarders, telemark skiers and alpine skiers. Yep. You've got the 
center pinners, the fly fishermen, and the bait fishermen. It's yep. kind of three different. Well, and then you have this. Yeah. Well, it's the spin fishermen who are you know, the bait fishermen, and you have the people who are lures only. Right, lures only. only. So there's a, in, fl- then, in fishing, there's all sorts of different subcultures. Yeah, and and yep. uh, one of the things I've always, I, I don't care. I've, I've yeah. never cared. I've I always I, I like catching <laughs> fish, and I'll try any technique. And I'm I got excited about center pin fishing though. Like I've never seen it, and yeah. I'm I'm anxious to get to give it a go because around here that's not a common technique. No, I mean you probably don't need it. <laughs> you don't need it. it yeah. The thing is, like with a fly rod, I could show you how to do the same technique. And on our water, that's not as brawling. You don't need to drift something for two miles down the river you know? right and, and this they're doing this on big water that's heavily pressured so they're trying to get the most out of their cast you yeah know? and they sure are they're using the rods like 13 feet long yeah 13 foot rods and yeah. you know i i use a i go out to new york and fly fish and we we use um what's called a switch rod and that's a 11 foot fly rod with a heavy shooting head so i can get long dead drifts it's similar um you know idea um but with with a fly line yeah and the, the one thing I, I i by the way i love fishing with long rods i don't care what kind of fishing i'm doing when you get a big fish yeah. on a there's 10 a, or 13 a lot of foot, leverage there and... you feel everything yep. it's it's way fun in the summertime um when i bring kids fishing on lake ossipee we fish with collapsible um sticks basically they're just big long crappie rods that go 13 feet long with a piece of string on the end of them mm-hmm. and uh, we catch big white perch on those. You yep. get a kid, a seven-year-old, holding this 13-foot-long rod with no reel and a piece of string, and they're catching white perch. Yeah. And it's a blast. You know? yeah. and and the, 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 it's that the same feeling. Rod with feeling the, it. With, um, on those bigger fish, uh, it, it can make a, a positive difference in landing fish because um, a lot of these rods are, have, a, have a much softer tip than the average fishing rod or fly rod. And when you're using, we're using a surprisingly light line sometimes to to catch steelhead because they see a lot of a lot of fish, uh, fishermen and and lures and rigs and everything. So they're not going to hit something on twenty pound test, which is what you'd probably want to be using for a fish that big. Yeah. yeah. So so you're using seven pound test, um, and when you hook one of those twelve pound steelhead on seven pound test, if you have a stiff rod. It's gone before Game you know over, you have yeah. anything. Whereas with a 13, 12 foot, 11 foot rod, at least that that rod will flex, and you, and you get a lot more cushion against a break. Yeah, it absorbs it absorbs that yeah, it absorbs pressure. a lot of it. You know, what I ought to do. I ought to get a rod manufacturer on the show to talk about the science of that because there's a lot of there's technical. Another show for you. There's a whole month of shows there but there's a lot of technical <laughs> oh yeah um reasoning for, yep. for, for and they have they you know that. they have rods that have that flex all the way to the butt they have rods that flex halfway down mm-hmm. for, for all different you know purposes yep and, and it's something i know nothing about all i know is that when people talk about rods i can only think about sex and it makes me uncomfortable so i always change the subject because i because <laughs> i'm i don't like get too awkward with it <laughs> And the flex and all that. Oh, I love it. And the tip. And the <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so like I said, I called uh, Dana Snyder, and she was actually fishing. We had set up a Skype call, and she, in the morning, sent me a message, said, I can't Skype with you because I'm going fishing. If you want to call me, I'll answer my phone. So I was using Skype, and she's using a cell phone. So forgive the quality, but I was talking to her while she was fishing. That makes her a nerd. And especially, she took a break from catching monster fish to talk to us um, on the phone. And I probably wouldn't have done that. I probably would have said, I'll call you tomorrow. But she, she cared enough to do it. So this is, this is uh, Dana. And she also talks about her ice fishing event. Here she is. And you can go to fishnerds.com, and I'll put a whole bunch of photos of Dana's fish up on our website. Fishnerds.com, hanging out with Dana Snyder. Dana is a fisher person from New York, from Worcester, New York. And the reason I called her is because on the Fish Nerds Facebook group, she keeps posting these crazy pictures of fish she's catching. And I thought, you know what? We don't have enough people catching fish on this show. So we thought we'd call her. And Dana's fishing right now. Hi, Dana. Hi, how are you? Good. So where are you fishing? I am fishing Lake uh, Lake Niagara, which is Lake Erie, 
um, right between the Canadian border and the American border. And, and, and it's like and how, yep. How's the weather? It's a little breezy, but not bad at all. The water's green, and we first cast hooked into the first lake trout. It was beautiful fish. I'll post pictures later. Ah, but crazy. um, it's amazing. And, we do a slip float on a, we have a center pin, and so we have a slip float on opposed to our, our normal, you know, when you drift off our float rod, you know, you set your float. But this one is a slip float, so it goes down because the Niagara's so deep, Lake Erie's so deep. So there's parts that people don't even know how deep it is. So you tie this little thing at the top, this little green string, and then your float falls up to the top of it, and then you're right where, it's, where you need to be, you're right where you're stacked up, and there goes the fish. <laughs> That's crazy. You know, I've never heard of center pin fishing before until I saw you doing it. And so uh, Michael Frank, one of our uh, fans, uh, was emailed me last night, just like a thousand things about center pin fishing, which I'll talk about later, but... Uh, so is that your style normally? Is that what you usually do? Oh, yes. I have been center pinning for nine years. I absolutely love it. I don't think I even know how to go back to a regular fishing pole. <laughs> My children, um, they they get their own, you know, they have their own fishing pole with the time them. I, I, don't, I don't even, it's not even the same. It's just so easy. Center pinning is so easy. Almost, it's bigger than a fly, a fly reel, um, but it's, you just pull a string out to your left. It's from an, it's from England. It was originally in, in England, and you know the French Canadians in, in Canada. Yeah. So that's where it came through. So that's you know um, my husband has been doing it a little bit longer than me, and he introduced a lot of the people around my area to it, and it's amazing. It's um, we get well we get the graphite from, you know from Genomus, and I have a GLX that I am nine. I have. Um, special made rides. I have all kinds of. I have a uh, kingpin, center, center pin, and that's like the school. And um, what it does there is that uh, you cast it out, and it can. I can drift for 200 yards, 300 yards, whatever, as long as there's no one else fishing, you know. And I can just drift and drift and drift. And it's all about where you set your weight. You know, you have a um, a leader line as well on this main line. And you set your bobber up, and you want your leader line pretty much your arm's length. I don't know, I'm that long arm, so <laughs> um, my arm length, and then I set my I set my weight mostly to the top up by the up by where the swivel swivel would be, mm-hmm. um, so that it gets a nice flow and it's not catching on the bottom and the fish, you know, are up and down. And it seems to work good for steelhead and trout, salmon, uh, lake trout, everything like. These rods are unbelievable in action. You get in them. You can get an ultralight. You can get the medium. You can get the heavy, which is, which is what my husband's using mainly for, like, heavy fish. And these fish, these these lake trout are huge. Um, you know, 22, 25 inches long, easy, all day. Oh, that's nice. They're massive fish. Yeah. That's amazing. I have to, but, I have to try this. Because I, I honestly have never heard of it until yesterday. So I'm, I'm shocked. Uh, yeah, I've, it's I've been really easy. For years, so yeah, I'm gonna have to give it a go, and I, I'm sure nobody um, in my part you don't of the state. Have to get, you don't have to go out and get a Jewelmas. You can go out and get, you know, a, a Saint Croix. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I started off on with Saint Croix and Islanders and stuff like that. And I would take when I started learning how to cast. I would tie up a heavyweight. Thank you for luck to you too. Um, I would tie up a weight at the end of my. Um, line and I would sit in my yard and I would pull it out from my, because I'm right here and I'd pull out my line from my left and then I would bring my rod behind me and then you just kind of let the line go through your fingers. Oh, nice. Um, Like, you want to put your ring finger, it kind of goes through your ring finger and your middle finger and it flows through your fingers and it hits the water. So, I cast it a few times out in the yard and it worked out pretty well. Nice. And um, That's really cool. You know, know, let me ask you a question. So, the, there's no drag on these reels, right? You do you use your hand as a drag? Like, do you have to like slow the line down? Um, there is there is drag. Um, there's it's a it's called a clicker, mm-hmm. and you can get them in um a like one you can smooth your finger, or you can get one that you can twist it, and it'll drag. My husband doesn't have a drag on his, so when you don't have a clicker, I mean a, a clicker, he doesn't have one, so it backspins, which can cause bird nests and a big old mess. So I do, I'm, I have a kingpin um, center pin, so 
Mine is orange and it has a nice clicker on it. It's got the best flow. I had a raw flow. I've had so many over the years and I, I can't one after the other. They're just all, it's, it's got that nice drip. I mean, it's just a nice run. It's just the way it flows right out. It's just like butter. It's just so nice. I love it. I have a lot of Googling to do about, about this thing now. Um, now, what kind of fly are you using under that? Um, now, see, sometimes I don't use a fly. I use, I actually go salmon fishing, so I get salmon eggs from the females. I kill my own eggs. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I tie my own sack, and we use different color sacks. We start choose these pink, these, like, faint pink with white, orange, whatever's working. Sometimes that's it. You know, they don't want eggs, so we go with what's called a bead. And this bead hooks up on your, on your uh, leader line with, like, it's like a little necklace bead. Out, you know, they come in all different sizes, and they have a little plastic piece that you shove up in between the line, where the whole little line's going through, and the bead. And you shove it up there so it's real tight, and then you bite it off, I bite it off. And I bring it down about two inches from my hook, or an inch and a half. And then I hook it up, and I tie a fly. Sometimes I'll tie a fly on it. And honestly, I don't use a weighted fly at all. I use a a floaty fly, I call them, that don't have a, a hard face, so that they drift along look like they're chasing the egg, a single a single egg that's ready to beat. So I have, I have a lot of good luck on that. And, um, but during trout season, I only go with wax seeds. I don't use egg packs or anything. I go with wax seeds and catch um, tons of trout, and I love it. Rainbow trout and downs, it's, it's amazing. We go to tournaments all the time, and uh, Wells in New York and the uh, trout derbies and then in the ice, you know, during, well, this time we come around, it's right before the ice, you know, we know we're up in Niagara. Well, where we are from is Wyoming County, which we're very fortunate that we have a lot of lakes around us mm-hmm. um, that we are allowed to go on streams and fish. And now they're opening up this, this dam that's called Gabby Dam. And, all the steelhead from um, Lake Erie are going to be coming up towards my house, which is awesome. Yeah, so I'm really fun. excited about that. Yeah. yeah. So, and then, then we go ice fishing, you know, and then I have all, we do all kinds of running with that. We ice fish all season. We go to Pennsylvania, like I said, Vermont, you know, New York mainly, a lot of Pennsylvania. Was, um, my husband went to a Midwest Open for a big series. It was, it's pretty cool. It's really interesting. I would love I would love to get out to the Midwest to do some ice fishing. I'm a, I'm an ice fishing guide, and uh, I've never done it yet. But I I'm, love it. But I'm starting guiding this year, so um, I'm excited about ice. Oh, well, do you have a do you have a Vexla or a oh, yeah. fish finder? Oh yeah. I do. Oh good. I'm all into the modern ice fishing. I don't like setting traps. I think that's boring. I I want to go. No, so well, I don't understand that. That that drives me nuts. Yeah. I don't like it either. Well, I'll, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll take it back. When I'm fishing with my family with the kids, I'll set traps because it's, yeah, they, they like that's easy flags. for them guys. Yeah, my I, little boy I has a. Too, about it. My little boy, he's six. He has an F L eight, and he own? digs his little. Yeah, he's got his own, and he digs his little heart out. So when he gets his fish, and he gets them. <laughs> well, I always tell people who I, I talk to people who tell me ice fishing is boring. I'm like, well, it's, you know, if you're using high tech electronics, it's like playing video games. It's not boring. It's exciting, and it's, it is exciting. But before I had a Vexi, my husband had one. They didn't. But I would just sort of drop down two feet, let it all go all the way down two feet from the bottom, mm-hmm. or a foot and a half. I would, I would count my cranks up, and I would jig, yeah. and I would those jig. And then I would catch them all the time. I'd have a camera, and it, the camera was cool. But I saw some really freaky fish. I was like, whoa. <laughs> so it's like, I don't want you to bite my line. It's too big. Yeah, it so, much fun. so, I mean. And so it you, is. You're, and, you're, and you're sponsored, like your family is sponsored by Stryker? Is that what um, my, my father-in-law is, well, yeah, my husband's dad is by Stryker. I see yes, he is. He, um, we do, when we go in our tournaments, we, you know, put out their stuff, and then they, you know, we have our tournament, and then you win things, and then people buy things from them. And, you know, it's just a big sponsor thing. And, you know, here and there, sometimes we will with Clam. We had a couple things with Clam, and, uh, I can't remember the other one, but I really enjoy Striker. Striker is the best. That ice armor, the blue suits are just not where it's at. It's not, they're not warm enough for me. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not sponsored by anybody. I just, I've always just done my own thing. And this year, maybe I'll start looking into that kind of stuff. But it's way cool. Now, well, the Striker, the Striker ice now is very. It's a floatable um, suit. Mm-hmm. 
And as soon as it gets wet, it will float you. So if you fall through Lake Erie, where I'm at now, and you have a waterfall and the current's so bad, it's like molasses out here. It's insane. Oh, and all these whirlpools, you want something that's going to make sure that you're above that water. Oh, and it's, absolutely. Um, we do demonstrations every every year for the children. We have kid events, and we show them what it's like to cut a big hole in the ice and their suits to jump in and our suits puff out. And it's, it's pretty cool to teach them safety and how to get out and stuff. Oh, that's really important. It's a lot of fun. That's really important. Yep. Now, now the, the actual the reason I called you, first of all, you've been sharing these pictures on our Facebook uh, group all the time, which we love seeing. We ne- in, we'll never get tired of it. But I actually, I'm, oh, calling you, I'm calling you because I'm a little bit sexist. And I got called out the other day by another podcast called She Podcasts. And um, the women who run that show, their names are Jessica, uh, Jessica Kupferman and Elsie Escobar. They say that women don't fish. Uh, on their show, they were talking about the Fish Nerds podcast and how only only guys would ever listen to it because women don't fish. And so I saw you on you know on Facebook right then. I'm like, oh, I got to get more women on the show to show people that women do in fact fish. Yeah. And I, I think more should. My wife fishes. My two daughters fish. What advice do you have for getting more women into the industry? Because I think it's really that is that it's amazing and it's, and it's a talent. Like it's just like you pick. I really don't know how to describe it. Um, if I was to tell someone how to go fishing and they think it's going to be boring, I'm like, just watch. And I let them feel first. You know, I, I take somebody. I would take somebody who doesn't know anything about fishing and take them. And I have taught women to fish, and they love it. You know, I, they're catching more fish than me in the summer sometimes. Well, and, and yeah. you know, I, 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 I took them down and, they had a regular, you know, fishing hook, but I taught them how to bait their line. And when, I think a lot of the women have problems with live bait and grossness and fish smell and stuff like that. But you don't, you don't really smell and feel all that when you're in the moment because that rush of when you got a fish on, the lo- I, I don't know, I have, to have a love and a passion for it. So when you have that fish on and you don't know what it is, it could be anything, and it's just throbbing your rod, and you're just like your heart start, you know, running you're sweating and you're like oh my god this is amazing it's just the best it's one of the best feelings ever yeah and it's impossible to explain to someone who hasn't done it like they have to go experience it so you really got to you have to experience you have to let somebody experience it for themselves that that they can't judge a book by its cover i mean maybe they just don't know what to do maybe they need to be like you said they need they need to be taught and it only took me four or five casts to figure out center pinning and my husband and that was 10 years ago and he doesn't even have to hook up my lines like I've just watched and I've learned and I run with a couple guys you know all through the season that help and my family my one cousin he's really a good fisherman with my husband so you know we learn from each other too you know just as in anything hunting or fishing every year you learn something different every year it's something new and it's always a new experience but there's fish jumping in front of my face right now as we speak well you better get they, you better go catch them. <laughs> <laughs> oh they'll be here i'm not worried okay, good. I'm <laughs> they're gonna, here i'm gonna wrap this up here in a quick second so any last parting advice uh to anyone who wants to try center pinning um do it do it do it and you'll fall in love get the lightest feeling rod that's comfortable to your to your arm that feels good get a good nice nice flowing reel you know you don't have to spend the money you don't have to maybe start off with a a big rod first and a regular fishing you know a regular fishing reel because you can hook them up that way sure. and get the get the uh, because the longer the pole's easier it is to cast out too so we have 11 footers and 13 footers so get a larger get a larger pole, learn how to cast with that, then get your scent when you see like this is okay, wow, it's a big difference from trying to cast, you know, like a bait cast or a regular fishing pole that's only what, four or five feet long. You know, it's hard to get it's hard to get it out there. So when you're learning how to do this, you can even you can even drift with a open bale and learn it that way and then get in get a thunder pin and, you know, read up on it, watch YouTube videos really easy and i mean it's really simple fishing if my six-year-old can do it anybody can do it well, you know, and my, and my I, six-year-old's good at stuff that i'm stuck at anyway so uh, you've inspired me dana to try it <laughs> yeah i really i really really suggest to get you a nice light action well i would go to light action rod first go try for some perch even or crappies or trout and 
you know, you can even use them in the boat. It doesn't matter where you where you want to float, you can float. And streams and rivers are the best. Quick, you know, you can shallow drift. Just by judging the water, how deep it is, you can set your bobber so you don't get stuck and just be careful with your weight. I'm, I'm totally excited about this. So, hey, Dana, thank you so much for taking some time with me. I'm going to let you get back to fishing. Uh, well, thank you. I enjoy it, too. People can interact with you on the Fish Nerds uh, podcast Facebook group and uh, check out all your cool pictures there. And I will, of course, put everything up on fishnerds.com, too. So, hey, Dana, thanks for taking some time with me. We thank you for having me, and I will, I will be here anytime you have any questions. How about a little fish in the news? Sounds good. Is where you say, I love fish in the news. I love fish in the news. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. And fish in the news this week comes from our Facebook group. Our fans often are sharing stories with us, and we want to make sure that we recognize that they are doing this. So the first one um, <clears throat> comes from the BBC. You listen to BBC? Sometimes. I always think they're trying to kill me. Like, I used to drive to Littleton to teach in the mornings. Yeah. And I leave at 5 in the morning before New Hampshire Public Radio came on the regular airwaves. Yep. And they play the BBC. Right. And they always have this person talking in a really slow, thick, drawly accent. And yeah, I always, you think you're going to fall asleep. Uh, exhausting. The yeah. news is good. The information's solid. Yeah. But the... Oh, I know. Delivery, come on. Yeah. They're, they're obviously not making a podcast everyone wants to hear. They want to... <laughs> I think it's they want you to sound very serious, so you'll think it's important. Well, um, they are British. Yes. Yeah. All right. So this is from the BBC. Japan skating rink shuts over frozen fish controversy. What? Did you hear the story? No. This was all over everything. A theme park in Japan has closed a skating rink featuring frozen fish after receiving complaints that it was being disrespectful to animals. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Space World in the southern city of oh, Kiriashu had opened its aquarium-themed attraction earlier this month. Skaters could glide over 5,000 frozen fish in the rink's ice. That's insane. Uh, the park has since encountered a barrage of criticism online and has apologized. It also said the fish were already dead when they were frozen. <laughs> Oh, so they didn't like flash freeze them to death. That that's what people were worried about. Uh, I don't know. Like what... you got an aquarium, and then they just like drop the temp, and the fish freeze in the ice. Because uh, that's what I was thinking at first. Because it looks like they're they're swimming. It does, but they're they're frozen. They're frozen in the ice. Into so, they, the ice. so they like intricately place them. Yeah. In the water and then fr- flash froze it. Or yeah. Something? So let me read some more. A statement on the Space World's website said, "We have received a lot of opinions, such as using animals as entertainment." And an event is bad, and poor fish, and we sincerely apologize. Um, oh, and we sincerely apologize. And for some reason, the BBC spelled apologize incorrectly. Uh, General Manager Toshimi Takeda told AFP News Agency the theme park would now hold a memorial ceremony for the fish. Uh, <laughs> that's really funny. Um, I- I'm just trying to imagine the. Like, imagine you're a marketing guy, and you go to your marketing meeting, and you go, you know guys, we need? I got We need frozen fish. We need frozen fish in the ice in cool patterns. And so someone has the idea, and they're just spitballing. But then somebody else has to say, yes, let's do it. And then someone else has to pay for it. Yeah. So I just the, the meeting must have been like, either they all agreed, or somebody really did a good sales job. Well, I mean, it, it, honestly, it, it does kind of look cool. Like it is you got this spiral super of cool. fish, yeah. But you'd think, you'd think somebody would have been like, "Why don't we just freeze a foot of water and have live fish swimming underneath it?" That's uh, to, what I was thinking would be even cooler. Well, and then you can have ice fishing tournaments and 
Well, then people are going to skate into the ice fishermen, but... Well, they do anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy looking. Um, it's not just fish, too. They're crabs. It those look like they're plants. sticking out of the ice. Wouldn't people... Is that what... Did they melt it down? And uh, I, I'm assuming that's a picture as they were melting it all away okay. and cleaning it up. Um, the whole idea seems like a very um, not well thought out no, concept. No. I mean, they could have at least, like... I don't done digital design and put it on the on the yeah you know you don't have to have like think. real or or you could have fake fish. Wouldn't What's that, the difference? It's it, it, well if you're placing them anyway because then they could just say don't worry it's fake fish they're not even real. That's what they should have said. They could have just said that yeah and nobody would know any difference. They look like goldfish, but the website actually is not specific on the types because yeah, they don't fish. know anything about fish probably and they're just like they're fish right. They're not fish nerds obviously. They, they'd be more concerned with what kind of fish it was if they were. Um, yeah, but Japan, people in Japan love right, fish. Right, people in Japan. I'm, mean, saying, I'm saying the BBC. People yeah. from the BBC are writing this article. No, no. I, I, I'm always, whenever I read these articles, too, I always think they need to hire a fish nerds consultant to answer the questions that they're missing. Like, yeah. What kinds of fish are they? Yeah. Do we get them right? The media gets fish wrong. All the time. All the time. It's remarkable how wrong they are all the time. Oh, Did yeah. you watch The Watching De- Walking Dead? No. I love The Walking no. Dead. Season two, they go fishing in the pond, and they catch... Like a saltwater species. They catch a saltwater species. <laughs> they have a whole stringer. First of all, you love it. They're fly fishing. Right. Right. Sing in a canoe, flies line straight down the water. That's interesting. Right? How could that happen? They're not doing any casting. And right. then they come off the lake with a stringer full of black sea bass. Right. Right. It's just so, like, remove you from the story. It's like they don't... They don't know that it's more complicated than that. You know what I mean? Or that it's simpler than that. You want to make a movie, you make it believable, and you want to have someone holding a fishing rod, you right. give them a spinning rod, let it dangle in the water, and walk off with a stringer full of bluegills. Like, it, you can get it right. Yeah, it's without easy. Without spending money. I would think it'd be easy to get it right. Yeah. Or except for getting the bluegills, right? They can go to the local grocery store and buy the sea bass. Right, but so they probably just had somebody like go get some fish. You know, some intern. Hey, go get some fish. We need to make this scene pronto. Go get and some fish. Find and some a fishing, fishing rod. Yeah, yeah. And someone whatever dug you out, find. Dug out their grandpa's old bamboo fly yeah. rods. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's all wrong. And then the most recent season, there was nep- a girl was running through the woods and she had um, met some. I don't want to spoil it too much for you, but she met yeah. a culture of women who were fishing and drying fish and f- serving salted fish. And she ate what she called a salted herring, and to me, it looked nothing like a herring. So, you know, if they're going to have fish in multiple episodes, they should probably like hire me a little bit more. I mean, I yeah. could see if it was like one time, like a brief clip, and they screwed it up. It's like, oh well, well it was twice, but, but in, twice in what twelve seasons? Okay, so but that's still that's not a lot, but no, but I make don't know. me believe it. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm already believing in zombies. <laughs> <laughs> Get the fish right. <laughs> well, so. it's obviously a fictitious world, so maybe herring live in are different in this Or maybe walking dead this world. whole season's been a little bit more boring than it's supposed to be, and the herring is a red herring to oh, distract us from it. So anyway, real herring. Um, the takeaway from this Japan story is uh, don't skate on frozen fish. I guess. Now, if, it, uh, you know, if they did it flash frozen, they could eat them afterwards. Right. Like Japan loves fish more than anybody. Well, you'd think that, yeah, I was thinking that this was going to somehow be involved with, like, sushi or something. Yeah. And when I first saw this, like, skate over the fish and then pick which one you want to eat. Yeah. And then we'll dig it out of the ice and you can eat it. So what I want... They, they, they do that, like, kind of like aquarium thing there, right? In Japan? Yeah. Where you can, like, go in, they have an aquarium of fish, and you're like, I want that one. And they throw it on the table, and, and it's as fresh as fresh can be. Yeah, well, one of our listeners, uh, Keto Dan... He's in Japan. He could probably tell us. So if you're listening, check in with us. Let us know what um, what this is all about. And the question I have about culturally difference is, were these complaints from people who uh, are native Japan people, or were they Westerners who are visiting the right. lake? Because culturally speaking, it's a different planet, right? Oh, yeah. So, I don't know. A lot of, a lot of questions. A ridiculous concept, but uh, this now this company is now making world news, so... Wow. I'd like to make world, world news. All right. Next uh, story is coming from Wyoming Public Media. This is from Public Radio. Wyoming Game and Fish try new technology to control invasive burbot. Oh, I did see this one. Did you? The yeah. Wyoming Game and Fish Department are using a new technology this year to track the movement of the non-native burbot fish in the Green River drainage. PIT, 
uh, tags or passive integrated transducers are inserted into the fish's belly, which can be monitored by antennas to record when a fish moves upstream. According to John Walrath, the Green River fisheries biologist, burbot freed mostly on other fish, causing concerns for native populations in the river such as smallmouth bass, bluehead, and flannel mouth suckers. This is this Wyoming? Yeah, I didn't know they had native smallmouth. Animals. I would bet that's a mistake. I, I, I wonder. I'd, I'd re- want to research that one. Yeah, we've yeah. got some homework on this. But one you never. Eh. It's possible. Yeah, it's possible. They're definitely not native to the. They're actually not native to here. Did you know that? I did know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah you wouldn't know that. But of course. Uh, but uh, I would. I would most of the northern United States. I would question if they're native to any of those places. But I don't know Wyoming. There's a lot of fish species in Wyoming, so right. We think of Wyoming. I think of Wyoming. I think of trout, of course. Right. So that when I first saw this article, I was like, "Oh, they're going to be a problem for trout," but they're saying they're a problem for warm other warm water species. Well, which bluehead. Have you heard of that? I haven't. Not a fish I know, but fa- uh, flannel mouth suckers I know, uh, native to Seattle. Yep. Flannel mouth. Cool. Seattle. That's an interesting name a for joke. a fish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get it. Um, yeah. yeah, never but heard of it. But it is an interesting name for a fish. Yeah, and I always love an article that looks at suckers as an important fish species. Right, you know? well, all, all fish species that are native should be considered important, I yeah. think. Yeah, some value there. Anyway, I don't know if it's realistic to ever get rid of burbot in the drainage. It's just so. It's just something that we're going to see. If we get the burbot population pushed back enough that the basin can at least sustain themselves, the best. that would be a win-win. Uh, by monitoring the past of the burbot, Walrath says game and fish will be able to better inform anglers on where they can catch many as many burbots as possible to bring the numbers down. I would love to catch as many as possible. I was going to say, you should bring your bromance package My out there. Bromance uh, in Wyoming? <laughs> burbot. I, now, burbot. Why can't I quit you? Burbot are actually <laughs> native to our waters, though. They are. So I wonder if... If they, you know, if these are the same species that somebody moved from the East Coast, they are the same species, and they might even be native to parts of Wyoming. Now, just not that. Just a little natural history yeah. on burbot is they are native to deep glacial right. lakes, and they—I um, forget the science term—but they almost hibernate in warm summertime. They dig down the mud and they don't move for like four months. They just stay where they're at, and in the winter time, when the water's cold and they're, they're active, mm. and they spawn onto the ice in March, and they're the only. Um, freshwater codfish in the northern hemisphere. So whether you're in Russia or you're in Alaska or you're in Wyoming or wherever you happen to be, they are in the cod family and the only freshwater species you're going to find. Are they the, the are they all the same species yep. or there's no lotta, subspecies? Lotta, no, a lot, a lot. Wow. Yeah. Fish so nice, named it twice. So, <laughs> um, but really cool fish. And in New Hampshire, that kind of like... You have three months to catch them, and that's all you're going to do. So, yep. really cool. Uh, I, 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 I'm very curious about this. Um, when a new species is introduced, they tend to explode and take over an area that has a lot to do with the, with other species not having been around that species before. It tends to throw the whole ecosystem out of balance. We're trying to figure out an Achilles heel, says Walrath. As, as of last year, Burbot had been listed at as a non-game species, which means there is no limit as to how many burbot a single person can catch. Or keep. Or right? keep, yeah. And hopefully people... I assume that's what it means, keep. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because sometimes you see these invasive programs like with, with the silver carp and the Asian carp where people are bow hunting for them or they're Oh, yeah. There's them, some crazy videos online. And they throw them up on the shore and let them die. And yeah. I, I, have, I, have, I have no problem with people eating any kind of fish if it's sustainable. I have a huge problem with any fish being killed just because you don't want it in your watershed. Yeah. If you're yeah. not going to eat it. I have, a, ethically speaking, I might teach my kids, yep. you kill something, you eat it. And they're just piling them up on the shoreline. And bourbon are delicious. Well, so that's a tough one, though. Is I, it? Personally, I think that's a tough one because yeah. they are a, those carp are a huge problem. They are. I but mean, they also, problem. there's also starving people. Oh, I mean, you can eat them. They're delicious. Right? Yeah. But that's why they you, are brought here. What do you do with them if, if you're trying to get rid of them en masse and you can't? You find. What do you do? You find uh, a company. Can we, can we send them to food banks? Why not? Yeah. You can do New Hampshire. Wild game can be done that way. Mm-hmm. So why not have a program in other states? Well, you could use them for gardening. You you, could, are you, would you be against that? Ah, it's fuzzy. Yeah. It's gray. Yeah. But maybe make dog food out of them, make cat food out of them. Do something right. with them besides just killing for the fun of it. That's 
I well, know. the bears in Alaska, when they kill the salmon, they only eat the brain, right? Yeah, but And then the rest of the body neutrifies the ecosystem. Yeah. I mean, you make a good point. So you could, like, it's argue that way. Yeah. I hear you, though. But, you know, you yeah, know yeah, screw those you. bears, too. Right. I hate those I know, bastards. They're so kill them all. lazy. They're yeah. just gluttons. Stinky. Like humans. Gross animals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if we were animals, we would be bears. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But imagine. Be I, was, I was thinking, I was talking to my wife about this. Like, if I was a bear, like, had fur like a bear. Being fat would be cool, but because we have so much skin showing, being fat's weird looking. So that that's why people have to worry about being fit. True, is because true, it's our pink skin that's gross looking. Yeah, but if we were fuzzy, we're like naked mole rats. Yeah, we're like we're disgusting. Yeah, yeah. Now I think about it, people are gross. So yeah. anyway, that's that's fish in the news. Thanks right. for uh, participating in the fish in the news. Thanks for having me. me. Yeah, sure. All right, we have one more story from Fish Guy Josh and the Amazing James from the FN West. They tossed a little Fish in the News story our way, which is coming right up. Nate, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Claire. Fish Guy Josh. Amazing James. It's time for Fish in the News. news. Clay loves Fish in the News. I've heard. It's all right. It's okay. (laughs) What'd you find out this week? Um... This week, I to try my hand at fish in the news. I went for a different approach than the usual weird and wacky. Mm. I went for a feel good story. Um, this is one that I actually shared a little while ago. It's it it a September story, but um, on the heels of Veterans Day, I thought it was nice. Um, so this is. Vietnam veteran's dying wish was to catch one last fish. I think I saw this one. This was a really cool story. Love the picture. Yeah. Um, I'll send the link up to uh, to Clay. It's actually off of Grind TV, which is like more of a skate and surf right. kind of website. But they do a lot of fishing stories. Right. And uh, this was one of them. Um, Vietnam veteran Connie Willett knew he was nearing the end of his life. Cancer taking its toll. So he made two dying wishes, to be baptized and catch one last fish. Thankful to folks at Carl Vinson VA Virginia Medical Center in Dublin, Georgia. Oh, VA, not Virginia, sorry. Uh, (laughs) Were able to make those wishes come true, giving the U.S. Navy vet some precious moments of life while undergoing hospice care. Um, Apparently... um, The VA chaplain, uh, Sam Skaggs, baptized Willett. Um, And then a Greg Centers, a hospice social worker, took him fishing at Lake Leisure, the pond behind the VA Medical Center. Nice. Um, Willett was wheeled out in his hospital bed uh, to the pier. It looked really cool. I love the picture. Yep. Uh, Centers bought the bait and tackle, and he let him know that it's called fishing, not catching. (laughs) Uh, I told him we may not catch anything, but he said it doesn't matter. He just wanted to be out there uh, doing this and um, just doing it was was good for him. Uh, But he actually did catch a fish. He caught a bluegill. Yep. uh, And he ended up catching four bluegill total. Nice. Um, And it was really a great quote from Sinners. He said in those moments, uh, Willett wasn't a cancer patient. He was just living life. He said he saw his face light up when he reeled in the first fish. All of a sudden, the cancer and everything else went away. And what you see is that precious few moments of someone really enjoying life, Sinner said. Sinner said the hospice is about living, not about death. And that people are people that are dying can teach others a lot about life. Uh, later in the day, uh, Willett's cousin came to visit and she you know, showered them with praises for everything that they did. Yeah. Um, I know when my grandfather was... Um, near the end of his life in hospice care and at home hospice care. I mean, they went out of their way to, uh, really make, make them happy yeah. and, and settle their final wishes. And it's, you know, it's, it was a really cool thing to see. I mean, I come from, uh, uh, several, several members of my family are in, were in the Navy or the armed forces. So for me, it was a really cool story. Yeah. Salute to the veterans coming off veterans day. Yep. And a passion for fishing. I uh, I saw that one and hospice is pretty darn cool stuff. Yeah, I thought amazing. it was the picture says a thousand words. I mean, I could yeah. not read anything to that story. Just read you the headline. Yeah, and he's like take in, a he's look on at a gurney picture. too. Yeah, right? he's, he's basically on a on a bed on the pier. Yeah, uh, he's got a little Zebco right 
Zebco reel with a bluegill hanging off of it. That's and, what it's all about. I mean, you can see it on his face. Like, he is... Yep. He's excited. Totally, totally. I tried to get uh, some bluegills on my kids' lines this past weekend. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, uh, where were you at? We were up north in Mendo. Okay. Yeah. Not, not with Snoop Dogg and smoking Mendo, sipping on chin and juice. No. No. No, we were in Mendocino, <clears throat> um, and we purposely rented this place. It was a little cabin Oh, on a pond. this was the cabin you rented. Yes. Okay. Yes. For way too much money. Get there and find <laughs> out that uh, the, the pond uh, has no fish in it. It was drained two years ago. They moved all the fish into the reservoir. But when I booked it, they didn't bother to tell me that. Even though mm. I purposely asked, I directly asked, are there fish in the pond? It was told, sure. Yeah, no fish. Like mosquito fish? <laughs> Probably. My worms were nibbled. It was really funny. The bobbers yeah. didn't move. The worms just got nibbled. There was yeah. nothing going on in that pond at all. Even the reservoir, well, I couldn't catch bad. anything because it rained all weekend. Anyway, okay. Um, <clears throat> all so, right. fish. What do you got for me? I got... Uh, what was this one called? Basically, it's a story about the uh, the Manhattan in Shinnecock Canal on Long Island in New York. And uh, there was a massive die-off that just happened a couple weeks ago in November. And uh, I shared it on the Fish Nerds Facebook page. But um, it's it's pretty incredible stuff. Um, the pictures, of set, a friend of mine from back east uh, sent me a video that he saw with like a flyover from a drone. And the entire canal is just like full of dead bunker. Um, so Manhattan or Bunker on Long Island and probably in other parts of New England. But uh, it was interesting because you, you're looking at this video and they're flopping everywhere. You think fish kill. Usually you think like red tide, they're yeah. all poisoned, they're all dead. But if they're flopping around still in like a massive group like that, uh, that's something a little different. And uh, let's see. <clears throat> The New York Department of Environmental Conservation issued a statement saying the closing of locks at Shinnecock Canal early Monday inadvertently trapped a large school of Atlantic Menhaden, small silvery fish, also known as Bunker, in the canal. So uh, it's probable that they were chased into the canal by predators, those predators probably being bluefish and or stripers. Okay, because you mentioned to me it was a predator-based fish gull. I didn't know what you were talking about. Yeah, that's what it is. So when I was a kid, and this is uh, my story for our... our uh, our, our for the novel the novel oh, yeah, the okay. novel writing thing um it's a story i love to tell and i'll, I'll <laughs> leave it for the for the novel but essentially uh the bluefish just chase the bunker into the harbors and corner them and you end up with these insane just like explosions of fish coming out of the water and uh there are a few stories from when i was a kid that were just incredible but this it was really to me it's a little funny that it happened in november that seems a little late. Usually, like, August is the time that that sort of thing happens. Maybe September, too. November seems a little mm-hmm. bit off. Um, but to see the entire Shinnecock Canal just full of dead fish or, or fish that were cornered, essentially. So they got kind of cornered shocking. in between some locks and died? Is this what's yeah, going on? Yeah, so the locks are usually kept closed, on, you know, like, when they're, when they're raising and lowering because they're controlling the tides between the two sides of, of the South Fork of Long Island. Yeah. And... Um, it's it's basically probably they got schooled in they got chased they went into the canal and uh, in a massive school and once that happens they start, yeah, they, oh, okay. they start running out of oxygen and whatever and that's it but um, I mean if you if they, they school <laughs> like any other schooling fish and yeah. they just follow the herd essentially so but pretty crazy stuff and uh, I, I really I don't know. It was, it was neat to see, but kind of scary at the same time. Yeah. So. Is that your old stomping grounds? Yeah, no? we used to go there when I was a kid all the time. Yeah. In the summertime, Mike and I, um, we would uh, we would go out there, and that was actually where we'd catch the, the nice-sized snapper. Like, like uh, call them either, like, snapper blues are usually the smaller ones, but then I guess they call them chompers, too. Or I don't know. We had different names for them. <laughs> but um, what do we call the little guys? Like the pan-sized ones that were pretty good. They were good eating. Cocktail blues. <laughs> cocktail blues <clears throat> anyway that was the place to catch the cocktail blues it's got a really nice uh access to the ocean from there too there's a good canal a good inlet and uh excellent excellent fishing in shinnecock so nice right name. on yeah so shinnecock is a, that a fun name shinnecock shinnecock <laughs> <laughs> anyways it could be yes <laughs> well that's cool yeah so we got a feel good story and a uh I feel not so good. And story. Uh, interesting story. Interesting story. Yeah. yeah. Right on. Yeah. Fish, fish in the news. Fish in the news. All right.
All right, so special announcements. The Fish Nerds will be making a special appearance. Three days will be at the New England Fishing and Outdoor Expo. Three big days, Friday, January 27th, 28th, and 29th at the Holiday Inn in Boxborough, Massachusetts. This uh, expo is one of the biggest in New England. Captain Sean Tibbetts will be there giving seminars. Uh, Mike Iconelli will be doing seminars. Cliff Crotchet, Bass Master Elite Angler will be will be hanging out. Uh, there'll be live birding shows, all kinds of cool stuff going on. Go Fish Dan puts on a great show. This is the region's most talked about annual fishing and outdoor event. Come experience the latest innovations in fishing, hunting, boating, and camping. Try out the best gear. Talk to top manufacturers to learn more from the world-class outdoor sporting professionals. The New England Fishing and Outdoor Expo is produced by Dan Kenny of Go Fish Dam Productions, making it the fishing and outdoor show that's for outdoor enthusiasts by outdoor enthusiasts and featuring the most knowledgeable fishing and outdoor professionals in the industry and the fish nerds will be there. So again, that's in Boxborough, Massachusetts, Friday, January 27th, Saturday, January 28th, and Sunday, January 29th. You're going to want to be there and stop in and say hi to the fish nerds and be part of the action. So that's it. You have listened to a couple of fish nerds when you should have been fishing. We'd like to thank our family for, for, for supporting us while we podcast. Go on Fishing Quest and do all sorts of silly things that nerds do. If you would like to support the Fish Nerds, go to patreon.com and search for Fish Nerds and give us a dollar per episode to help us crowdfund this show. That's like four bucks a month. You won't even notice it. But we will. So help us out. Special thanks to uh, Dana Snyder for sharing her center pin fishing story with us. Another thank you to Nate Hill from Hill Country Guides for sharing his stories with us. Um, And until next time, follow the code of the fish nerds, spawn early and often, avoid free lunches with strings attached, and swim against the current every chance you get.